Okay. All right. So, <laughs> Edwin and Kristen, how are you? She she's scared of you, but she wants to sit there. Tell her you're not scared. <laughs> you can sit there. <laughs> we need to be here because we come and go. So Wait, no, you guys are live. Because like, you guys are all your here. Uh, <laughs> welcome to our home. And there's a bathroom right here in, in the hall. And uh, we love it when uh, Jay has uh, brings people with the kind of people that he brings into our home because it uh, brings such a wonderful spirit. And we learn so many wonderful things. And so we're really happy that uh, share our home and uh, our home uh, uh, is basically consecrated to this kind of thing mm -hmm. and um, I really love it when you bring people here so welcome welcome thank you man. thank you oh he turned it right <laughs> thank you back. Yeah, yeah. so I don't know where everybody is tonight this is I know great you know um on the mailchip account I, I get uh Feedback on how many people, and we I got one yeah. of the highest <laughs> click rates. So I don't know what's going on. If there's some competition tonight with some activity, I don't know. Thanks, Evan, Kristen, for again hosting. We should appreciate it. Um, and thanks for all of you being here, Holly, yeah. particularly making the time. Yeah. Again, I'm sorry there's not more. We okay. have a few online, it's but my pleasure. Grateful that you took the time to do that. Thank you, Jane. Or monitoring I'm sitting over here the Zoom crowd. <laughs> <laughs> she had her laptop hidden while we were going on the screen. <laughs> so yeah, so um, hopefully you read Holly's bio, although I am going to have her just really briefly when we begin talk about um, what brought her into this uh, career she has. It's very interesting. Not the first one. Reporting. <laughs> That's true. It isn't, but um, I personally have a great appreciation and, and um, respect for reporters and media because that's how I get my information. Mm -hmm. And so um, it seems like they've taken a big hit lately. Um, and maybe some of them should you know, um, be criticized pretty heavily, but I think most try to do their best. I thought the, is it the SJ? SPJ, SPJ rules of ethics. That was worth reading. So that's online on the the posting for this event tonight. That's worth reading. Um, you know, it would be good if we all lived by those ethics. I think I was impressed with those. Um, and so we're gonna first of all, since we don't have very many people, we do have. We're gonna just quickly one sentence. Tell us something. Tell us your name and something that's on your heart or mind right now. Let's start with Steve. Okay. Um, but my name is Stephen Parkin, raised in Salt Lake. What's on my heart and mind is who to vote for in the upcoming presidency. I've never been more confused. And I have a very divided family. Brothers and sisters who have, have commonly been on the same side are very much not on the same side of the decisions today for this particular set of events. And uh, I, I just listen to see why and, and try to figure things out. And I may not decide until things get closer. Uh, I wish I wish the country produced better candidates all around. But uh, I'm going to leave it at that. That's Thank you. Some of my thoughts. Jay. Yeah. The, I say they can hear everybody but you. So please do that. Oh, Thanks. I'm Kristen. And... Iverson and I just jumped into a very kind of intense course on chaplaincy, becoming a chaplain. Oh, that's okay. So it's, it's cool. kind of cool and fun. Yeah. Where are you taking that? It's a, it's an online course, okay. but I have to do clinical stuff here. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some wonderful people. You're going to be it's very good at that. Experiences. Mm -hmm. You're going to be really good at that. Well, I don't know if it's a thing you're good at, but mm -hmm. it's just what I want to do. I love it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Eddie Iverson. I belong to Kristen, and 
one of the things I'm excited about is the fact that she's taking that class because I'm learning by care through through her. And one of my biggest problems is through because I'm an engineer, I, I don't want to listen. I want to fix things. OK, and she's teaching me how to listen. And, you know, I mean, because that that's the primary uh, uh, skill of a good chaplain is to listen well. And I'm, I'm practicing this with my coworkers. I'm practicing it with my kids. And I practiced it with you a little bit just now. <laughs> and it really opens things up. Instead of me talking, 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 I'm actually learning something and I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm Charlene Durham. I, um, what am I, it's on my heart and mind right now is communication with people who are very close to my heart. And so I've been able to spend a lot of time with them, which is absolutely fabulous. And consequently, I do most of the talking because they're, you know, I'm the entertainment for them. And uh, <laughs> since a lot of them are end of life, my son has told me it's time for me to get some younger friends. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. And I'm Peggy Bowen, uh, originally from Salt Lake, but live in Houston. Um, what's on my mind is, and that's the reason for wanting to attend, is how do you discern through media what to take in and what to not take in? Mm -hmm. I find both in my conversations and my own thought processes, how do I properly analyze, critically think through what is good information and what should be discarded? I'm Trisha Benyon from Salt Lake City. And Steve, I didn't realize you are one of the undecideds. I, I hear about them, but didn't know they yeah. really, really existed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really good to meet you. And the upcoming election is on my heart and mind. So learning how to sort through the media and what you hear in the media is also very important to me. So. A little bit. Got an I've got a nice little something going on. There we go. All right. That's a good idea. We'll do that. Um, or I'll have you do that. So Camino de Santiago is still on my mind. I'll just leave it at that. Jane, where are you? Are you back there? There you go. Well, Yes, Jay and I just returned from walking the community of Santiago for six weeks, 500 miles. Uh -huh. uh, we just returned on Tuesday, and so that's wow. very much on our minds and um, kind of the, the processing of that, which I think will take a long time, and sort of trying to see how we fit back into our prior lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, oh, there's a lot. Did you say 500 miles? <laughs> so um, I could drive 500 miles. How do we get the people on Zoom to I'm speak? Going, well, they can unmute themselves. Let's do it. Uh, Amy says, please tell Trisha Benyon hello. Oh, oh afterwards, sorry. Oh, <laughs> hey, is it? Now I need to know. Can you hear me? This is Amy. I can't oh, show. Fun. Okay. Where I am, but if you can hear me, yeah. I'll say hi to Trisha myself. Oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. It's it. lovely to see you. I mean, you can just say, do you, does anyone want to say anything? I figured they heard you. Does anybody on the Zoom um, want to share what's on their heart right now? Yes. Can you hear Mark? Amy? Maxwell, you want to do that? Can we hear Yeah, you? sure. Hi, everybody. Jay, sorry I can't be there you in need person. To unmute yourself. I am unmuted. Uh, He's unmuted. Yeah. Darn it. You could type it in if you need. If we can't get the... Do I... <coughs> Who was that? He coughed. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe he was coming through. Any ideas, Jane, on that? Michael, why don't you type something and then we'll read it. Sorry. Oh, so Amy can hear them. Oh, oh interesting. 
but we can't. Do you know where these folks are that are not in the room? Are they in Salt Lake, Ogden? I'm not Lake sure. Crater? Okay. No, no. Yeah, let me take a minute and then we'll have to move on. I take it you still can't hear me? Kristen, since we have a minute, I guess no, we no. need a chaplain. Would you need to know the rudimentary doctrines? The microphone, so we don't want to choose a different microphone. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we'll just have to do it. I you don't want to take too much. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, thanks, honey. Mm -hmm. So we can do that. Yeah. Thanks, for the welcome. I Michael. Thank you. Thanks for the welcome, Michael. All right, we're going to turn the time over to Holly. No. All right, take it away. Great. <laughs> I, actually, I hope we'll just have a conversation. So um, I have a really um, unique background and certainly non-linear. So uh, my husband and I met at BYU, got married, had a baby a year later, um, had a second baby a year and a half after that. And that baby kind of changed the trajectory of our lives because she was born with really significant disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we did not anticipate that um, when we were planning our life. And so we, um, it just really shifted, I, I think my whole mindset, but it took me a little while um, to grieve her disabilities. And then the new, you know, kind of come to grips with the new way of parenting this child. Um, had another baby three years, I mean, uh, one year later, 12 months later. Yeah. So I had three kids in two years and eight months. Yeah. And um, we, when that third baby was just over a week old, there were news stories that came out of Romania about a dictator that had been executed along with his wife. And um, a few weeks after that, we started hearing stories about orphanages in Romania. So this would have been, he was executed on Christmas day, 1989. And in January, I started to hear about there's kids in orphanages. And I didn't know that the orphanages still existed in the world, actually. And uh, my husband and I were both like, we want to adopt. Didn't know how to do it. We ended up moving from Washington state where we had been for his job for about a year and a half, came down to Utah, came back to Utah, I guess. Um, bought our first house, had these three tiny little kids, including one that had disabilities and the next Christmas, so when our baby, the youngest, was one, there was a 2020 show, and Barbara Walters was on doing uh, We Want to Show You Inside These Ro Romanian Orphanages, and it was and remains the strongest spiritual experience I've ever had in my life, and I was on fire, and I knew I had to go, and I told my husband I have to go, and he said, I know, and a few weeks later, I was in Romania. Um, we came home with two little kids and, um, and that kind of was the beginning of our family, which is very unique. So, and we actually have 25 kids and, uh, we adopted 20. We're raising, I gave birth to four, two of them had disabilities and we're raising a granddaughter who's the 25th. So she's 10, um, right now. And I'm almost 60, so <laughs> we're 50 years apart. So, which is funny and weird, but, um, that really occupied my time for 30 years, right? Is raising mm -hmm. kids. And uh, before I got married, I was uh, a registered nurse and uh, it was an associate degree and I took 30 years off. And then um, in the meantime, <laughs> I wanted to do, I wanted, I needed to stay a little bit engaged in things outside my house. And so I didn't work full time ever, but I ended up getting involved in politics. So um, it, I don't know. I mean, it was a, again, an anticipated path. So in, um, I had taken my nursing and I ended up teaching childbirth education classes. And then I became a home birth midwife, which was, you know, totally different. And, and then a midwife in Utah was arrested and charged with practicing medicine without a license. And there were a few of us that are like, the law's wrong. She is not wrong. And so 
uh, we decided we were going to change the law in Utah. <laughs> so, so we had people tell us, um, you have no idea what you're doing. You're going up against one of the biggest lobbies in the country, or I mean, in the state, and um, it's never going to happen. So we didn't know what we were doing. We did go up against one of the biggest lobbyists in the state and we were successful, but it took us five legislative sessions. So it takes a while sometimes, but along the way, I, I found that I really enjoyed the legislative process. I don't really anymore, but at the time it was, um, I think a lot kinder. It was a lot more substantive policy discussions. It wasn't so ideological of you're on this side and I'm on this side. It was, here's the issue. How do we come together on this issue? Right. And, and that process was fun. And, um, in 2011, I ended up becoming a legislator. I was a midterm vacancy replacement. So somebody stepped down, I was able to step in. Um, and it was, it really was a lot of fun. So, um, before that was 2011, but 2008, I started a blog. So way back in the day and called it Holly on the Hill. And it was a political blog. So it was one of the first in the state um, to just talk about this is what is going on on the Hill and my perspective, right? So when I stepped into the legislature, people already knew who I was because I'd been out there, you know, talking about them for several years still in the legislature for a, only a year and then um, did Holly on the Hill until maybe 2014, 15, something like that. But after I left the legislature, I was like, um, I ran for office again and I lost. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna go to school. And so I did. So I went back to get my bachelor's degree um, and then went and got a master's degree and then got a PhD and I finished that two years ago. So <laughs> you saw kids at home. Yeah. 20. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We had, we had 20 at our peak actually, but the, they start, they had started to get older, right. And transition out of the house. And um, we've had several children pass away, including that first daughter um, of ours that, that I had given birth to. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I just, I, I, uh, my bachelor's and master's degree are in communication mm -hmm. and in, gosh, uh, 2016, I think, um, the editor of the Salt Lake Tribune asked if I would write columns for them. And I said, yes. And uh, that was Jennifer Napier Pierce, actually. Oh, yep. Yeah. And, and so I did that for four years and then, and, and that got me through the master's and part, uh, partly through the PhD. And 2020 happened. So, so the last of my classes went online and um, I got a phone call from a friend that said, where are you like with your test taking and all of that. And he was the editor at the time of the Deseret News and that was um, Boyd Matheson. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, I'm taking my comprehensive exams in October. And he goes, okay, I'll talk to you after that. So. What had happened is the Deseret News had purchased Utah Policy, which was a newsletter that was started by LeVar Webb like 20 years ago now. Mm. Um, yeah, and he had kept it going, but he kept it as a kind of like a calling card. He was a political consultant, and this was one way to get his name out there is to do this newsletter. Anyway, the Deseret News purchased that in August of 2020, and I came on board as the editor in, 20, in December of 2020. Now, editor sounds fancy. I'm actually one person. It's a one person team. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody does any writing. Nobody does like it's me. So, <laughs> but the title is great. So I appreciate that. Um, so yeah. So in December of 2020, I transitioned from the Tribune over to the Desert News and I write columns for them. And I do this Utah policy newsletter every weekday. Um, it's very, it's a news aggregator and it's very specific. The audience is for people who care about politics, don't have a lot of time. So I don't do the gotcha headlines of click here to find out, right? Um, and and even then, like, even if you're a reputable uh, news organization, you still want to do that because you want people to click on it and read it. So, I'll, but I don't do that because I know my job for the newsletter is for people to be able to skim it. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What was and the PhD? 
um, political science actually. <laughs> yeah, nonprofit work. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that's the that's the role of the of Utah policy. So I think one of the things that's interesting is I never had any journalism training. I've had communication stuff, right? But I taught myself how to do a blog and I taught myself how to write and 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 the more you do it, the better you get, right? Hopefully that's the case. But one of the things with media that is so interesting and and when social media became a thing, when it was the new media, remember, it looked like it was going to open up opportunities for citizen journalism in ways that could get around sometimes gatekeeping that came from traditional media. So if you remember Walter Cronkite back in the day, what was, you know, what was his tagline? <laughs> Something, right? It's like, then that's the story or that's the final thing or yeah. whatever it was, right? And, right? And it was, you, you had three channels you could choose from and, you know, you had the nightly news, uh, trust in journal, uh, in the media was high, but it also was kind of controlled, right? So you had newspapers were still really like they were still publishing every day. So social media comes along and it sounds like, oh my goodness, we're going to be able to have people cover things that the traditional media can't cover, for example. So maybe your city council meeting, right? That's great. We're going to get a broader spread of media. Well, what actually happened is you don't have to have one bit of truth in what you put out there. Um, you can have an Instagram channel or a TikTok channel or a YouTube channel, and you can have millions of followers and you don't have to say one word that's true. And there's not, I mean, you can fact check, but a lot of people don't, right? So so then you start to have the ad dollars go away, the subscription dollars go away. Deseret News publishes once a week. They have a Sunday paper that, well, it actually- Twice every Wednesday. Sure. And only on the Wasatch Front though. Oh yeah. So the Sunday one actually goes, it'll go all over the nation. So some, it'll get mailed to you um, and it has the church news in it. And then along the Wasatch front, there's a Wednesday one as well. Um, I usually have a column in the Wednesday one. Um, so, so it used to be a daily paper, right? And it was, I came in in December and in January was like January 1st was the, the they shut down the presses, mm -hmm. right? Tribune, same thing. I mean, you just look all across the nation and newspapers are folding. Small ones um, are being either, they either go under or they're being absorbed into larger ones, but you can't get the same type of coverage that you used to. And I think it's because we have so many competitors now in this space. We also have changed how we consume our news. So who wants to volunteer how you get your news right now? Well, people often get it in three-minute segments right in the bus. Okay. Yeah. Just oh, during your, there, she's asking. During your there. commute, how do you get your news? Um, I, I'm, I'm discovering that. Yeah. Uh, mo I, I've tried to avoid some of the problems that you're describing. Yeah. I tend to go to the standard newspapers. Yeah. Tribune, Des News, yeah. even though it's all digital. Yeah. That's my first source. Yeah. Okay. Great. I hate what my phone gives me. And... Since I'm lean way left, <laughs> I read the Wall Street Journal just to make sure yeah. you know, to get another perspective. So I, I read the Wall Street Journal yeah. almost every day. That's actually a really great way to make sure that your information is balanced, right? Is that you have to read from multiple sources. That's how you help sort, right? Is you start to look at multiple sources. Yeah. Well, I'm retired, so I get to listen to NPR all day long. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. NPR. Okay. Right. And I would say I scan. I try to do the yep. New York Times. Scan. I try to do the Wall Street Journal for the same kind of reason. And then whatever yeah. stuff else comes down, I'll yeah. kind of get on it. Some of it's pure nonsense. And it, so. you know, and algorithms will feed you stuff that they think you want to see, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons we have such a rise in anger, I think, online is the algorithm actually responds to anger more than it does to mm -hmm. thumbs up. It mm -hmm. it knows that like you get a reaction and you respond and so it feeds you more of it. Um, what's interesting, I well, it's there's a lot of interesting about social media, but you your feed is totally different than mine. Mm 
Mm -hmm. right? And you look at your feet and you think everybody's seeing the same thing I'm seeing and it's false. Everybody has their own worldview. Like we have our virtual reality goggles on, right? AI is Can really I just running. interrupt for a second? Yes, Mike please. Maxwell, Hi, Mike. Um, has said news websites, Desert News, KSL, Salt Lake Tribune, BBC, AP News, yep. and Substack. Awesome. Yeah, Substacks are a great place too. Substack is. What was that? It's I'd a, love someone to tell me that Substack is. I see it a it's lot. A broad oh, it's, a, term for a it's 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 another aggregator, which yeah. means it's got a bunch of different people who can write on there. So have you ever heard of Heather Richardson? Yeah. Yeah. So she Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. She writes on Substack. Okay. So you can like it's like for five dollars a month or something, you get her daily newsletter. Well, she has a gazillion subscribers, so she's making a gazillion dollars now, but mm -hmm but she writes every day, right, on Substack. So people can go there. It's like back when we used to blog, but everybody could go do it in one place so you could get more eyeballs. Okay. But that's what Substack is, yeah. Okay. I've been diving more into recently to uh, Barry White Weiss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, impressed. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, yep. because she seems like she's posted. It's Barry, B-A-R-I, yeah. Weiss, W-E-I-S. Pretty press. She started, she works, she, she worked for a very, that's no, large... It's been Washington Post or yeah, Politico something like or something that. like that. Um, yeah. And she just felt like they weren't being as honest as they should about news. Uh, she's a les married lesbian, um, Jew, um, but she seems to try to be fair and, and covers yeah. you know, a wide variety of things. Yeah. So what's interesting is we consume our news differently now, right? We don't sit down at the kitchen table and read our newspaper in the morning while we have coffee or hot chocolate or whatever. Much, it's great. The Desert News. That's good. But digitally, I've got the trail. Yeah. <laughs> but the Desert News, I still. Right. But you only have two opportunities a week, right? right. So, and the Wednesday one is kind of thin. Actually. It is. But, but it has a great column. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get Carter, President Carter I, turning 100. I did. Week, did you meet Carter really turning 100? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's a great guy. He's such cool. a humanitarian. So, so one of the things that's interesting is I've got, you know, kids that kind of span an age. My oldest is 37. My youngest is 10. But I asked my daughter, who's 20, I asked her when she was still a senior in high school, where do you get your news? Where do you think she gets her news? Social media. TikTok. Yeah. specifically no, I believe it. tiktok right and i said how do you know it's true and she said well because they say it is right they. They. right it's a they and so the, there was just i included this in my utah policy newsletter either last week or the week before but 39 percent of kids 18 to 28 get their news from tiktok right that's a big chunk of our young adults who are getting their news from TikTok. It may be true, but it might not be, right? So you can filter. Um, and, and one of the things with media literacy is our kids don't really know how to do it. In fact, I'll say a lot of adults not, don't know how to do it, right? So my parents are in their 80s. They don't know how to filter news. They are Fox News junkies. And that's like, um, <laughs> For me, I don't consider Fox News a reliable source, actually. Um, I rarely, like never actually, include articles in my newsletter that come from Fox News or from CNN or MSNBC. Um, so there are organizations out there that will rate slash rank media outlets. And it kind of looks like a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. So the one I look at is Ad Fontes, and it's um, ad like advertising and then F-O-N-T-E-S, but they will, you know, rank major news organizations and the Deseret News is trying to position itself as center, right? I think it's further right than they think it is. But <laughs> I, like I'm a registered Republican and I'm a total rhino because I'm totally voting for Kamala Harris and doing it joyfully. And <laughs> I look, I was like I said, when I was in the legislature, we worked together well across the aisle. And it's like, I didn't move. What happened here? Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of those disaffected Republicans. Um, but um, what you see on there are it, you will have center, center right, center left. And then you'll, you'll start to get further down the bell curve, some that are more right, more left. And then you get down to where you're into misinformation and disinformation. 
and some, they even have rated some podcasts. And then you can go to what's called malinformation, which is deliberately telling false stories mm -hmm. to cause harm, right? Mm -hmm. That's it's deliberate mm -hmm. that you want to cause harm. So like immigrants eating pets, that's malinformation, especially spreading that story, right? Mm -hmm. But when you look at those, those new sites, so when I do Utah policy, I, I look at about two dozen sites every day. Um, I do the local ones. I don't do the tiny ones. Every once in a while, I'll get onto the city journals and I'll look, but it's, it's not as often, but I'll look Deseret News, KSL. But if you look at KSL, you have KSL, KSL TV, <laughs> KSL News Radio, and they're actually different entities. They cover different mm -hmm. stories and they have a different bent. Yeah. Um, and Tr Salt Lake Tribune, KUER, um, UPR, which is Utah Public Radio up in Logan, and the St. George News, Cache Valley Daily. I mean, so you get a, a smattering there. And then for my national ones, I'll do Reuters, AP, Washington Post, New York Times, um, sometimes BBC, which they, I think they can be pretty reliable. And as long as it's not talking about the Royals, <laughs> <laughs> they're really good on international news, actually. Um, and I do Wall Street Journal, The Hill, and Politico. So, I mean, that's kind of a smattering. Can you get Al Jazeera? I can get Al Jazeera, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. And and they have they can have good articles too. I it's really interesting to look at Middle Eastern stuff um through the lens of Al Jazeera, mm. right? That's that could be pretty interesting. But if you so I've done this now for almost four years. It's really interesting to see how different news organizations will treat the same type of news story, right? Mm. And like I said, I don't take Fox News. I don't take MSNBC. Um, and if you look at the ad fontas, they're out here on in mm. the margins, right? They're far left and far right. Yeah. So, so who's at the top? And so I get who's on the screen. Reuters, Reuters, AP, Washington Post, New York Times, right? The they're, Post. Yeah, Washington Post is. Yep, Wall Street Journal, right? So you're talking center, right, leaning right, right leaning left. left. Yep, yeah. Wall Street Journal leans right. What about NPR? NPR is also, I check NPR every day as well, also. So that's what, that's at the top. Yeah, the they're up there too. Yeah, it's up there too. So, so then do your articles move, aim for any particular target, center right, center left, or? I, so I try to have a mix, right? So I'm looking at all these sources every day so that I can have, well, well even in Utah, who leans left? Salt Lake Tribune, right? Mm -hmm. Who leans right? Desert News. Same on the national scale, you've got ones that lean left and lean right. So I like to cover um, that. One of the things I was surprised with Wall Street Journal actually is they have some really good international stories. They don't do very many. They'll do like one a day maybe, or even a couple a week, but they're in depth and they're, they can really be good. They've done some really good stuff on Ukraine actually. So anyway, so that's, I try to give a mix, right? So that people can say, okay, from these different sources, um, I, but you don't take a position. Only, when I write, I do. So when I'm aggregating, you can tell my bent if you, I mean, if you look at the stories and the quotes and stuff that I put in there, but I try to be at least, I try to be even handed, mm -hmm. right? To say, look, we're, we're talking about Hurricane Helene. So you have some misinformation that's being put out there, but here's what the news stories are saying. Here's what Twitter's saying. I get a lot of my news from Twitter, actually, X. Mm. Um, and that's where a lot of journalists hang out. And it has been that way for more than a decade, right? Is they go there for stories. And that hasn't changed. That really hasn't changed, actually. So. Can I read a comment? From Please. Amy Dixon. Mm -hmm. Don't people learn about primary and secondary sources anymore? Nope. It's not that hard to look up the reliability of sources. Like you say, in every independent study I've seen, those who primarily or solely have Fox News as their source test verse on geography, politics, history, etc., mm -hmm. than those who watch no news at all. <laughs> so it makes people worse informed. I don't know why anyone considers Fox a news source. Mm -hmm. And I used to be a lawyer at a firm who represented Murdoch. So I know how they are focused on money and not journalistic ethics. Yeah. I, and I think that's fair, right? I think that's a fair assessment. And um, when the Jack Smith um, 
indictment, whatever that document, 165 pages came out this week. My husband read it, by the way. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. It's like, okay. Um, when that came out, you had one of the Fox News, Neil Cavuto say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is criminal. Like a Fox News host was willing to say that, you know? Yeah, right. So, so you just have to... I understand that. And I will say, no, not a lot of people do check sources. And it's even within the, the journalism industry, especially the younger journalists coming up, they don't source uh, as much, right? So one of the things that has happened with journalism is that we are rewriting each other's stories now. Mm -hmm. So I do that. I'll take an AP story and I'll add, you know, it'll be AP and then add something in from the New York Times. I do a lot of writing on like genocide around the world because nobody else wants to do it. And I do. Um, so Sudan and Ethiopia and some, there's other places as well. And, you, you know, so you'll start and you'll just because I don't I don't have the sources in Sudan for me to call. So I rely on other people and I'll put it together and make a story. Well, that happens all the time. And in fact, I was surprised to see even what I would consider the major news organizations, New York Times, AP, Washington Post, they do it too. They don't do it as often, but they do it too. Desert News does a lot. Desert News does a lot. a lot. Yeah. So we're trying to hit 50 stories a day, right? So we have a benchmark of trying to hit that many. The Salt Lake Tribune, I don't know what their benchmark is, but because I look every single day, I would say they don't publish more than 10 or 15 stories a day max. Right. And they just, they're shrinking their staff. Um, they say they're doing fine. I don't know that that's true. Right. But I don't, I mean, I can look at the number of stories that they publish and they don't have as many, nearly as many. Comment question. Um, a lot of professions have peer review. Mm -hmm. You know, as an engineer, we were always checking each other's work. Mm -hmm. It was a way to raise the standard of that sure. profession. Yeah. And not to get lawyers involved. We wanted to check yeah. each other and that quality, you know, was, it, it added respect, respectability to our yeah. profession. Sure. So my question is about journalism schools on university campuses. Yeah. What, what's happened since the Cronkite years when journalists held themselves to a high standard of excellence? And, and they held each other. I think they still do. And I think that's the role of editors. Right. So if, I, I will say, so SPJ stands for the Society of Professional Journalists. And you can, you, you can belong to the society or not, but you do have journalistic standards, right? So not every outlet that produces content adheres to those standards. But if you look at the ones that I've talked about, they do, right? So if you're going to cite a source, like a person, mm -hmm. there are times where you can keep that source anonymous, but there are things that have to happen to be able to do that. You can't just make it up, yeah. right? You can't just say, well, somebody told me, right? Um, you have to be able to show a paper trail, like to the editor even. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's differing levels too. So you can have a beat reporter who just is going to do, here's the straight stuff that I heard in city council, or here's the police report, whatever their beat is. You can have um, reporters that are longer, do longer in-depth stories, right? And so they may take a story and this is changing a little bit too. And this is something that I think we'll lose. Um, like longer stories about fentanyl, for example, the opioid epidemic. Yeah. It takes a while to dig into that and talk to people, right? Like we can talk months to get a story like that instead of churning out something every single day, you know, here's my 600, 700, 800 words for the day. Um, so, so we've lost a little bit of that as well, or they're wearing multiple hats. You've got an investigative reporter who also has to write a daily story and trying to juggle all of that. But you also have somebody like me who's called a columnist and I do sometimes do reporting, but when I'm a columnist, I opine, right? And I can put my own opinion in. And, and you label it as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you label it as such, but you will also see, if you look at the news sites, you will see something that, call, that is sponsored. It's a sponsored story, and it looks like a news story. It's an ad. Okay, so what is, what, how should I interpret that? Give it a, a low It's value. an ad. It's, it's an ad. If it's a sponsored value. story, it's an ad. It may have value to you, but it's an ad, right? And it's written to look like a news story, and, and everybody does it. 
Um, and is it an ad to sell merchandise or to sell ad, sell more advertising? Or to, or to sell a concept or something? It depends, right? Yeah. So um, the New York Times has, like, they do a lot of reporting, but they also do recipes. But they also have a section as you get down towards the bottom of their homepage, if you just scroll down, it will be like, here's our favorite kitchen whisk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then, yes. and they actually sell stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a sponsored ad. I'm thinking like KSL has run some from a guy that wrote his own book, self-published, and he runs like he runs these sponsored stories, but it's to sell his book, right? That's the idea. Let me tell you what happened. And you, but you, it reads like a news article, except you have to see the little sponsor at the top. Um, yeah. So I, I want to kind of go back to when you were talking about the quota to put out X amount of stories and then couple that with 24 seven news that we have now juxtaposed against Walter Cronkite. He put out, you know, an hour mm -hmm. of, you know, what, four or five mm -hmm. stories. Now it's 24 seven news mm -hmm. cycle with mm -hmm. people in the industry having to churn out mm -hmm. Around the clock and, and and entertaining news to keep the mm -hmm. ads going to keep yeah. it going. So I'm interested in your opinion on the commercialization behind the 24/7 to keep that much news out there. You just can't have that much news in 24/7. It just so it it's a it's a different way of looking at deadlines because there aren't any right everything is a deadline so it used to be you know the whole stop the presses mm -hmm. well it's because they literally had a press and yeah. it would go to press every night so that they could churn it out and deliver it on your porch every morning well you're right it's a 24 7 news cycle now and you can you know I, i'm old enough to remember that tv had like this the little square and the beep when you got to the end of programming for the day, right? The multicolored square, whatever it was. And and then you just went to bed because there was nothing on, you know? <laughs> and now, you know, you've got 2000 channels you can choose from, whatever. But so, so they're trying to survive and they're trying to figure it out. So if you've got a little place like down in Moab and they're trying to do their own little city paper, it's so hard, right? Because you may have two people on staff trying to keep that whole thing running and then you have somebody with a lot of money sue you because they don't like an article you wrote right that just happened and luckily the judge sided with the newspaper but it i mean why do you want to stay in this business right so one of the things with journalism is people who are in it know that it's a dying industry so how do you morph it and how do you change it right and how do you as a consumer of news how do you know where to go for that I don't consume my news on TV anymore, like ever. I don't want to watch an advertisement. I, like I never see a political ad because I don't watch TV. Um, I get my news online, like everybody else. Did you have like, something still to say? still need to churn something. Yeah, I know. Because oh, almost everybody's, all of y'all have to churn so much out yeah. to keep us entertained. Yeah. Otherwise, um, we'll Kristen bro Kristen's brother, well, her whole family are writers, but. Uh, and he, uh, he said a lot of people say that writing, the skill of writing is no longer needed. They say that to him, and he says it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. He said it's needed more and more, and that AI, you know, is, is, is threatening it, but it still makes it even more important. How do you deal with AI? So, How do you, what do you think about the skill of writing? Is it I am a writer. And so for me, I, I mean, I've never used AI to help me write because I like to write, right? But AI is infiltrating the journalism business. And, and by, I mean, it, there are forces pushing AI in and it's part of that churn, right? But for a long time, AI has been doing sports stories um, from small publications to big ones right? All you have to do is plug in the right numbers and it generates a story. And, but it's been doing that for years, right? The sports writing. So you can, the personal stuff about, you know, quarterback so-and-so had said such and such, right? But the Desert News is one of the only outlets in the state that covers high school sports, right? But, and they have reporters, but they use AI to help with the stories. 
on high school sports, for example. So the other thing with AI is it's coming whether we want it or not. And so we can embrace it and figure out how to use it uh, in a way that is helpful, right? Or, I, I mean, it's going to be there anyway. And one of the things that super interesting with that 165 pages from Jack Smith, there somebody within the Deseret News ran it through a new AI tool. It's it's with Google. I can't even remember the name. It literally read the 165 pages and turned out a podcast, complete AI. Yeah. Sounds like human beings having a conversation, not computer voices, right? And and you've got a female voice saying, "Oh my gosh." Have you read the stuff that's in this? This is uh, unbelievable, right? And it sounds like a total mm -hmm. normal human being having a conversation who's saying, oh my gosh, the stuff in here is just so damning and explosive, right? And But they're having this conversation based all on AI. Wow. But they still need a journalist who has some boots on the ground, eyewitness sure. to events, and sure, 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 sure. The, sure. AI, the AI final edition to say yes, I can verify. There, that's all true, matches. right? That's all true. It's just that AI, like technology, right? When the printing press came out, was world changing. So we just technology keeps changing. So it's called Moore's law. Technology doubles every eighteen yeah. months, and the price goes up, right? So we like social media has only been around since two thousand eight, really. Um, kids who are graduating from high school, even college now, there will be jobs available for them that don't exist right now because the technology is not there, but it's coming. Do you have a question? I do. And it's about sourcing. Yeah. Because all of these, these stories, all of these things, the AI, whatever, I need to know where the source is. Mm -hmm. I was with a friend today and said, well, let, you know, wondering about things. Well, let's ask Alexa. Mm -hmm. I'm bad. So, Alexa, tell me about that, that, that. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, where is Alexa getting the information? Mm -hmm. And so that's, how, yeah. how is, is that? So, is that so one of the things, so, so my husband works in computers and he, he does identity security, keeping college students um, identity secure online. But he said, one of the things with AI is if, if you like feed the same thing through multiple times, you start to get more and more error, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, what was that show where he cloned himself and each time he cloned himself, it became a poorer version of himself. I can't remember what it was called, but um, yeah. Right. So it, it's like that. You, you, the first version, pretty good, but each time you feed it through, it gets worse. But genetic inbreeding, <laughs> but, but the sourcing comes from the internet, right? Mm -hmm. So if you Google now, if you literally go to google.com and you put in a question, the first thing you see is AI generated. The first thing, and it will tell you, this AI says, this is the answer to the question. And then it'll have a link and you can still click on a link and go to a source. But that's one of the issues. And it's, it's funny because with a PhD, you have to source, right? You have to know primary sources, secondary sources. Wikipedia is not a source, right? So I know how to go to primary sources, but it's becoming a lost art, I think, mm -hmm. right? It is. Mm -hmm. So if I go to the AP and say the AP is my source, well, what is the AP's source? Mm -hmm. Is it a personal conversation? Are they sourcing it from somewhere else? Is it the AP sourced from the New York Times? Like, so I try to go to primary sources when I write my articles. Um, but that's getting more difficult. I think it's so that, I, I think it's becoming less common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's really you know the first place my head goes with oh in the polls today or in the polls in this fifteen minutes or the yeah. polls here what polls yeah much where yeah. what were the questions who's yeah. doing it who's that so who's that? you can ask an you AI can program yeah what their sources mm -hmm. you know so you can ask Chat GPT where'd you get that information you know. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and the same with the polls, right? So so the hill, for example, um, it's a it's a online news source that covers politics. So does Politico. Mm -hmm. And they do roundups, right, of other polls. And so it will say, it will say to you, in this poll, you know, conducted by this source, right? And if you go to the source, you can read the poll and the cross tabs and stuff if you want to. Um, it's it's interesting, right? Polling is interesting, and and you can have competing polls that say different things, yes. right? Harris is up here. No, Trump is up here. No, no. That's why I some of it is 
who you poll, right? Uh, yeah. Polly? Yeah. I'm curious about what you see in the future for younger generations, the ones that aren't here, because I know our kids don't read newspapers right. and those sources, and I think a lot of them don't. A lot of them get it from podcasts or yeah. Joe Rogan or yeah. people like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they're, they're going to be basing their decisions and worldview on those kind of things rather than what yeah. they're kind of used to. What, what do you, no, I don't. is there anything positive? Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just that it's different, right? So when the telephone became a thing and it started to show up in people's houses individually, there was a big outcry that it was going to ruin the family and people weren't going to sit out on their porches and talk to people anymore. Well, that did happen, right? But it, it didn't destroy society. And now we've got smartphones and we have social media and we have algorithms and we and know- there's that... arguments to say that is destroying society. Cell phones, smartphones, and, or and the social combined with social media. Right. Jonathan Heights written a lot about that. Yeah, I'm sure I know. You're aware of that. Yeah, so that's so you can make the argument that those advances are actually working against us. Except, except that there's right. Except that there's good in it too, right? We're oh, yeah, carrying good, around good. a mainframe computer and something this in our pocket, right? We have oh, more yeah. knowledge than yeah, I'm not know, denying most that. of the I'm world just, has I'm ever had. Saying it's, there's a big concern. You're, you're right. And, and part of it is, right, what it does to the psyche of kids, right, when their their brains aren't fully formed and you're getting these negative messages. And, and I mean, it's it really can be dangerous. It's a, It can be also very beneficial and a great tool, right? So even part of the conversation with, should you have cell phones in schools? Some schools have said, even in Utah, we're not going to do that. We're going to have our phones outside the classroom. And they've noticed a change in social interaction. We know that loneliness is a huge issue in the United States right now. The Surgeon General has called it a health public health crisis, right? People are dying from loneliness. We don't connect anymore, right? It's Robert Putnam's uh, work called Bowling Alone. Yeah. We've lost that social cohesiveness. We, we used to be multi-generational, right? And, and in other cultures, they still are, yeah. right? But in the United States, we're single generation for the most part. We don't we don't necessarily live that close to parents. Um, my parents were in the military. None of their kids have ever really lived that close to them, right? Um, I've got kids now that are kind of close to me, uh, mostly in the state, but it, it, it's one of the things where it's hard to know where it's going. I think, but I think there's, I, I think there's reason to hope that while it may look different than it looks now, um, that there can be good, right? That there can be good. And, and I think kids need to learn to be discerning and that's hard because they have to have people who teach them to be discerning and that's hard, right? Is it the teacher's job? Is it the parent's job? What if the teacher doesn't know? What if the parent doesn't know, right? My daughter is 24 and she's teaching school. She's teaching junior high kids right now. Great, I love her. Where does she get her news? Instagram, right? And TikTok, right? But and and what she watches for fun is Jerry Springer. I'm like, why do you watch that crap? She goes, it's so funny, right? It's like <laughs> must be reruns. It is because he's dead. <laughs> it is right, but it's like she thinks it's the greatest thing ever, right? So it, it it's just one of the things that, that I have come to feel um, for me is. I believe from a religious standpoint, there is some capital T truth, but largely it's like I said at the beginning with our uh, Facebook feeds, they're uniquely tailored to us, right? And, and that's where we sometimes get into trouble with assuming that our experience is everybody else's experience, right? And we, and we see it in politics. Well, that never has happened to me, right? Well, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened, right? So I have multi-ethnic, multi-racial children and my children that are black, their experience very, very different than my children that are white, right? And then me. Same, same kind of generational time. Yeah. And yeah. they're all raised in your house. All <laughs> raised in my house. So it, in my house, they're treated the same. At their high school, not treated the same. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember back during when Hillary Clinton was running for president. I was at the church. I was at the uh, uh, the family history library, and I was scanning some of her dad's, you know, uh, 
uh, photos from around the world. You know, he was the managing editor of the Desert News. So uh, awesome. Yeah. And Are we Queen's Castle? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a shocker. <laughs> Her dad, her dad, excuse oh, me. Oh, I misspoke. Okay. Her dad. But I was. Oh, anyway, I was scanning these and talking. The guy that was helping me, we started talking politics. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like I told you, Eileen left. And, and he started telling me stories about Hillary Clinton and the Clintons being murderers and this, right. that, pedophiles. That, you know, yeah. told, told all these stories. What do you do? I mean, it's happening now, too. You know? Yeah. What do you do when you speak with someone? Who's been fed all this misinformation? Do you call them yeah. on it, it personally? Well, or yes, a lot of times I do, right. and I'll say that's that's not true. That's not a thing, right? What if you remember? Do you remember PizzaGate? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. So he was talking about that too. Yeah. So this was the idea that spread that somehow there was this pedophile ring in a pizza place, and I think it was DC. Well, there was a guy who decided he was going to take matters into his own hands, armed himself up and showed up with a gun and looking to rescue the kids that were being, you know, trafficked. Mm -hmm. There's no There's basement. basement. Yeah. There's no kids. Right. What do you think his response was? Oh, I made a mistake. They, no, no they, they made, they moved. They found out what I was doing. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. He did not say, I wonder if I was wrong. He did not say that. He said, I must have gotten the address wrong. Right. That's a problem. And it's, I, I think it depends on what the relationship is. So the other thing that I'm particularly interested in right now is peace building and trying to reduce the contempt. And it is hard to have a conversation with somebody who says you are Satan. <laughs> I will not negotiate with satan and i'm like okay who said that to you uh yes you some specifically you? but some broadly right it's like if you disagree with me on this you're doing the devil's work right because only god fearing people do this kind of thing right only god fearing people vote for these kind of people right so so sometimes it's really personal i because i was a public figure i got death threats right and some of them were coming from like old people that were like I like, are you serious? Like, if you saw me face to face, would you actually say that to me? You're probably 20 years older than I am. And you're telling me I should be executed. Really? But you see how that's spread, right? So yes, I do call it out. Um, I write columns about it, right? I'll say that's not a thing. I'll talk about how damaging it is. I wrote a column about the the pet eating thing, mm -hmm. the immigrants eating pets. It is not the first time that that racist trope has been used right? It's not the first time it's been, it used to be used for Asians, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they're eating our pets. And before that it was used for Italians who were called garlic eaters. And before that, right. is whoever the out group was at the time. And it it's, it's just really deeply concerning to me. And so one of the ways to reduce contempt is you've got a, you've got to stay curious. And if it's a closer relationship, then it'd be like, you know, I've got friends that are like, you no know, babies are being aborted in the ninth month. And I'm like, yeah. but that's not a thing. Or after they're born. Or or they're in, after they're killed after they're born. I'm like, that's <clears throat> that's not a thing. Yeah, yeah. I read a report about that. And I'm and like people with master's degrees, my friends, when they're my friends, it's a different conversation because then I want to really say, okay, tell me, tell me where you read that. Tell me how you heard that because I've scoured the you know news and i cannot find any reliable source that tells me this but i'm really curious to you know to know how you came to that conclusion one of the things that you'll find is there's always a way we have more in common than we have different but sometimes we focus so much on the differences right um i've gone and done work with in refugee camps around the world and i i have never been a refugee um but i have been a mom and I've been a mom who's lost children, who's buried children. I have a connection with other women, right? <laughs> it's become easier for me to say there, but for the grace of God, the why, right? Because I could have, it, in fact, I read a book once called the, An Accident of Geography, right? Where we were born. Mm -hmm. There are people just as smart in Nepal as there are yeah. here, but they don't have the opportunity, right? 
-hmm. So it, it's super, fa super fascinating, right? To think about that. But if you can stay curious, right? If, if your goal is to correct everybody who's commenting on articles online, don't do it. It's just a waste of time. But if it's within your congregation, if it's within your community, like I, um, I work in the temple, the LDS temple, and I had a, another temple worker say to me one time, um, you can't, you can't be a Democrat and be a Mormon, <laughs> right? And I'm like, actually, that's not true. Um, we have people on our shift that actually are Democrats and 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 by the way, you had so and so and so and so in you know up in the higher echelons and and the church has said this about um, you can find truth in all political parties, all major political parties, and <clears throat> they were, they didn't even know what to say, right? And they stopped the conversation, right? I don't know if they've ever thought about it since then, or maybe they went there. Really, right? <laughs> That's interesting to me, but Utah's unique in some ways where we conflate religion with politics happens in Idaho too but it also happens in the south where people are it's red states conservative states that have a large religious presence right and you conflate the two you can see that happening with the evangelicals right now um but it, it's an interesting thing that makes me consider moving to a purple state <laughs> um just because sometimes it's like that's but that is not what my religion teaches. My religion doesn't teach me to segregate, right? And and judge people on because they're different than me. It doesn't teach me that. So you asked about you asked about the churn. Do you remember hearing the phrase if it bleeds, it leads? Mm -hmm. You ever heard that? Yeah, it's yeah. been around a long time. You know what? It still holds true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And cell.com. Yes, it's yeah. there are live stories about car accidents. Yeah. No, but and then to about but you know some, some the story. truth is that's what people read right and because now there's something emotional about it that engages you here so yeah so okay, I but do these do these bleeding events actually happen yeah I mean that's an important distinction so yes so yeah. but let me add but let me add this yes they happen and there are foreign entities that want to cause disruption within the United yep, States. Sure and after the 2016 election, so this came up during my PhD studies, there were Russian troll farms. China also was involved, but there were Russian troll farms where they created fake news sites where the stories were true, but what they did was feed you all of the if you if it bleeds it leads right all of the car mm -hmm. crashes and you know the abuse stories and stuff and if you went there and it could be like saltlakecitynews.com right sounds legit mm -hmm. not legit but they fed you all these yeah. negative stories and then what happened is people thought well this world is going to heck in a handbasket this is so, why we need we need a some kind of a grading system that at least purges out misinformation and malinformation. That's what and you what have remains, to do. hopefully, is truthful information as seen from multiple views. That's hard enough to referee. Yeah. Okay? But that is your job, right? That's your job. Because AI work. can't referee that. AI yeah. is not eyeballs witnessing an event. Mm -mm. All it gets is all the data, the ones and zeros that everybody writes. Yeah. It assumes it's all true. And now it Right. Creates a beautiful story. Right. A well written story from it. Yeah. So that we I'll are left to. For a second. Adam, yeah. Amy's had a comment for a little while. Oh, I'm so... sorry, Amy. My eyeballs are not good. No, that's okay. Adam, <laughs> it's popping up on yours. But she says people need to look for accuracy and relevancy and importance rather than think that news should be entertainment in air quotes. Um, reward stories. I think she's saying reward stories, reporters, and news sources that are factually correct. Do not vote for or support in any way with your time, money, retweets, or attention. Those who repeatedly, mm -hmm. negligently, or purposely lie, that should help those who are still undecided on who to vote for because only one presidential candidate has repeatedly, provably lied. When people tell you something, ask what their source is, and a yeah. poll is not actually news. It's just a slice of a small group's opinions, mm -hmm. informed or not, in one moment mm -hmm. in time. Yeah, that is true. But the issue in that is, a little they, don't, they don't think it's a lie. Right. 
it, they believe it is as true right. as we believe it is not true. Right. So to me, the crux of that issue is, because maybe our generation is gone, how do you take the younger people, maybe even, and teach them critical thinking, how to so, discern it? Because I don't see how they're going to get it, because I'm not sure their parents are giving it to yeah. them. I'm not sure their teachers are giving it to them. And political leaders are certainly not giving it to them. So I'll tell you, in, in Utah, and in K-12 through in Utah, they already there's an effort to teach media literacy. But I was part of a working group that was based with the legislature just a couple of years back saying, okay, is it enough to have an elective in high school that teaches you critical thinking, media literacy? And it's not. And that's the conclusion. Like you got to start down in elementary school, mm -hmm. teaching kids how to source where they can look for a source, right? The Wikipedia is not actually a source, those types of things. It's got to be built into the curriculum so that they can be discerning, right? And, and know what kinds of questions to ask. So that's one of the things with media is every media outlet has an owner. What's yeah. their angle, right? And, and sometimes I think we're going to have to question their parents. Yeah. Because their parents, maybe it's, some of the people we know, how do you take a 10-year-old and say, I'm going to question my parent? Right. It's one of the yeah. issues that you have in politics right now with, uh, in Utah, Last legislative session, we got rid of DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is literally illegal in K through 12 and higher ed and government organizations to talk about DEI. To if you're a professor, you can talk about it, but you can't have the, you know, black student union. You can't have that anymore. You can't have women's groups. You can't talk about or train on unconscious bias. Why? Because they were afraid that. The teachers and educators are woke, and now we're brainwashing our children, okay? Well, how do they learn critical thinking skills? Well, those teachers are doing uh, the heavy lift, right? If you if you take debate in high school, you start to learn some real critical thinking yeah. skills, right? Because you got to be able to argue both sides. It's a valuable skill. But if it causes but, you to question your own culture, your own sense of belief, that's where I think the rub is because when it causes you to say my parents but are it does up, my faith is screwed up you know I'm hearing things yeah. that are bonkers but it's coming from people in authority right but I think I, I mean I think even just look at it from a religious context within the the LDS church we have a lot of young people who are leaving the church right now well one of the reasons that that I've heard talked about is they have these phones now. They can go fact check. Wait, what? Joseph Smith was married to a 14 year old, right? Mm -hmm. And and I like I knew a woman in my neighborhood who didn't not know that information until she was in her mid 30s, and that was it for her. But once again, where are you finding it, and how can you trace right. the source? That I know. At? Well, you can look at the <laughs> church's website. Well, what does that mean? Well, but <laughs> <laughs> for that one, you well, they have well, to, to, to educate a few months shy. I know, a few months shy of 50, I know. They, they <laughs> hedge their bets there, but... But, I, but you're... No, I mean, you're a searcher, but I try to find who are the members of the Forum of the Twelve today on the church's website. Impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're trying to find it. To find who? Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. you've got to go That's find odd it. That you couldn't find that. They print it in their enzyme. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I've got, little, I've got this much room mm -hmm. to, you know, navigate. And how you yeah, I mean, I think those are those are the fundamental questions, right? That yeah. people are rest, wrestling with is how do we how, how do we harness the power of technology but minimize the harms? How do we how do we, how does it look moving forward? Like I've written pieces that have made myself cry on like Rwanda and some of the genocide yeah. can't get eyeballs. Nobody cares, but hmm. they really care about who's on the voice. They really care about America's it's got talent, so true. right? Yeah. It totally is true. I mean, and I, I work with a, I work with a, our senior opinion editor is 65 and he's been in this industry his whole career. And he said, I liked it better when I didn't know if people were reading my articles, right? No. You write it, stick it in the paper, it goes out. Mm -hmm. You hope 
and assume people are reading now we know whether they're reading or not yeah. and they know how many clicks occurred mm -hmm. and absolutely and how many seconds it was on yep. the screen and how many seconds and where did they go after that okay. and, yep yeah so back to the if it bleeds it leads it's not just that but it's the entertainment stuff right i mean we at the desert news have way more eyeballs <laughs> on um stories about the chosen for example or the entertainment ones than we do even on sports sometimes than we do on some of these weighty policy issues nobody cares these people care these people care <laughs> <laughs> go read the desert <laughs> these people do care yeah. right that sounds sad about the rwanda well yeah and i i had been to rwanda anyway it was it, it was a it was a good story but nobody read it yeah. <laughs> So how are you feeling about um i think it's part of how, it too how are you feeling about x uh twitter coming to x and that whole well not, not uh um vetting as much if, or at all so <clears throat> again x has an owner facebook right. has an owner instagram has the same owner right tiktok has an owner it happens to be china uh, they have all of our information nobody cares Right. Um, I am I'm on X all the time, actually. I use it as a source. It's, I, I would say, maybe not a primary source, but <clears throat> that's where a lot of journalists hang out. Um, I know that Elon Musk is trying to put his finger on the scale. There's no question. He has a favorite in the presidential race, and he is definitely putting his thumb on the scale. Um with what he shares and retweets and promotes and like i've tried to mute him i can't even do it i don't even follow him and he just because he's elon musk he's in my feed all the time but he doesn't <laughs> sense he's not censoring me. he doesn't have a group that censors and that's kind of like twitter before, look right? so here's here's one of the issues right the first amendment allows freedom of speech is facebook a speech platform yeah. or is it a business platform right it's it's really hard to tell one of the articles i uh papers sorry one of the papers i wrote when i was um in school recently was did facebook help promote genocide in um myanmar yeah. and the answer is yes it did because it didn't censor so it was against the Rohingya who were Muslims and they, they, it, there's a long history there, but no genocide starts mm -hmm. with the killings. They start with the dehumanization. Yeah. So Facebook yeah. did not censor calling them cockroaches, calling, calling for their extermination. There were monks who called for the extermination of the Rohingya. And there were Facebook groups who were set up to say, this is when we're going to get together to bring your you know, torches and pitchforks, basically. And it just churned. Mm -hmm. on Facebook in a way that wouldn't have spread had they not had that social media platform. So where, when is it censorship? When is it freedom of speech, right? You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Not anything goes. You can't mm -hmm. do that. When is it censorship? And when is it saying we've got to protect life here? Right. I don't know. Right. Nobody and should that be decision Nobody does made, either. Should that decision be made internationally? Right. For all the whole world or each country gets to set their own standards. I will tell you, Europe is a lot stricter than we are in the United States. I'm sure they are. And they do not put up with crap from the big ones, the Google. They I mean they just slap a huge fine. The American media from reaching uh, Europe. Uh the Europeans. I mean, they're virtual. No, well, yes. Yeah. I mean, sure. So like in China, you can't get news sources that are not Chinese. Right? You can't access BBC and stuff unless you're somewhere uh, where they can't track you and they track you everywhere um, in China. So, yeah. yes, they can filter. Um, in fact, if you go, if you're a politician and you go to visit China, they will not allow you to carry your own phone. You have to carry something else because they know that everything is bugged, okay. and all, including your social media. Yeah. But <clears throat> Holly, I heard everything you said about, about the problems with Twitter and how Elon has his thumb on the scale. Could we say the same thing about Disney Corporation and ABC and the other things they own? Right. All the media that they own. Yeah. Look. In the other direction. 
the media weight in the other direction on the the media has always been really it's been a tool to convey information but specific messages right so marketing and advertising was all designed around how do we convince people that they need to buy our product right and so now we say well facebook and instagram like they have all our information well you know what before that existed magazine companies had all that information they knew where you lived what you bought what were stores you shopped at and they would send you stuff right and they would get you to buy um is there a way to counteract like the thing that happened in myanmar uh which is happening here yeah. right here in uh, that you know about I mean, to me, the only thing I could think of is is truly is education. Okay, if if a person understands what's going on, um, but is are there movements that you know kind of crowdsource uh, people to react? You know, like you know how um, when I was in the seventies, we boycotted grapes. Okay, mm -hmm. do we boycott you know Facebook because they allow things like? Yeah. Are, are there any movements that yeah. basically, you know, um, getting the people together to, to counter what's going on? There are. And the question is, are they effective? I don't know. Right. So the state of Utah is suing social media companies for right. the harms that they're causing children. They're allowing parents to sue. They've changed, they, they've changed how they're going at it because they're allowing now a parent to say, I can bring a, a private right of action, which basically means I personally have a child who is negatively impacted by social media. It doesn't have to be part of a class action lawsuit, whatever. I can take it directly to um, the social media company. You've got Congress who's calling in Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg to say, come talk to us right now about what your algorithms are doing, right? But- they're also private corporations, right? So we know that Facebook and Twitter, X, that they all have people who are doing research. They don't release that research, right? In fact, one of my professors at the U did some time in Facebook um, as a researcher. They had to sign NDAs, could not talk about what they found, could not talk about how they prioritize stuff unless it came out in a public study later, which they don't do. Right. So if you saw the Facebook whistleblower, she brought out a bunch of stuff that said we are specifically deliberately targeting teenage girls and this is how and why. Mm. Right. So Congress is trying, states are trying, individuals are trying. Um, I think you've got different countries who are trying. Right. Part of part of what Europe is saying is you've got um, monopolies. Right. And you're not allowing other people to put out their content because you own everything they just slapped google with a multi-million dollar lawsuit i mean it's hundreds of millions of dollars which they can pay but um, um there's a Kelly, mike maxwell has a question for you he says i have worked in the ai technology industry no one that i know in that industry believes that social media is an objective form of free speech by any definition Algorithms tuned to mm -hmm. aggregate content and amplify outrage, fear, and unhealthy social comparisons yep. intended to drive engagement addiction yep. are not free speech, in my opinion. I would be interested in your opinion on this. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. We're we're dopamine addicts, right? Swipe, get a like. Yeah, our attention span is like nine seconds. It's like a goldfish. Mm -hmm. Right. It's true. Right. So Utah policy, we're taking a little hiatus, but I do um, typically do a daily video. So I write the the words and record it. And then I have a guy that helps me with the video. We keep it to under 60 seconds and more than half of our viewers don't make it through 60 seconds. They can't even watch the whole thing. Right. 60 seconds. Can't even That's do it. Amazing. Yeah. Right. So we're almost at time. How would you like to what final words or I have no idea. What, you, what would you like to leave us with? Uh, One of the things that strikes me that you said was stay curious. Yeah. And especially with people that disagree yeah. with you, ask them how yeah. they came to believe that. I think that's really critical. What else do you Look, would you like to leave with? I, I think the overall 
um, you know, what maybe we get wrong about the media. I, I will say, I think most people in legitimate media uh, are trying to do their best, mm -hmm. right? And everybody has a bias. We all do, right? Mm -hmm. And I just sat through um, last night, a two hour lecture from Hillary Clinton. It was great, but I can't sit and write an article that goes piece by piece by piece. First of all, nobody would read it. Second of all, it'd be kind of boring, right? So, so when I write that article about her speech, I'm going to be selective and pulling out what I thought was really interesting, mm -hmm. right? And, and maybe it's not interesting to other people or the people in the debate, right? So when you read an article about so-and-so said such and such in a debate, well, mm -hmm. that was one sentence or part of a paragraph, right? So everybody has bias, but everybody's trying to do a good job to be fair, but it's, it's a very demanding high turnover profession, high burnout profession. Um, there, the people like my senior editor who's been there for 35 years, they are going the way of the dinosaur. He's retiring in two years and you know there's nobody to replace him at this point. People are losing a lot of institutional knowledge and journalism isn't the only profession where that's happening. It happens a lot of places. People are changing jobs, even complete professions, not just who they work for, not just bosses. But I I've been a midwife. I've been a politician. I've uh, worked uh, as a communications director. I Now I'm writing and I actually am an adjunct professor at the University of Utah. So I'm teaching classes. And I mean, do you know, and, and I'm almost 60. My kids are like, well, I've done this for a little while. Now I'm going to do this for a little while. And that's normal now, right? You don't do the 35, 40 years and get a gold watch. So no more pensions, right? Those went away a long time ago. Um, so, so what I would say with your media diet is A, be discerning, but also have a broad diet, right? So like you're doing to check multiple sources, right? Or look at multiple sources. If you are a Fox News fan, counter it with CNN, right? Just to see how they play the same thing. Yeah. Do you ever see anybody move the dial at all if they're over in one camp or, you know? Yeah, um, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because you're yelling on social media. Right, so what <laughs> right? do you see, what is effective that you see to get people if they're far right or far left it, to move? I think center? it really is this idea of we have to decrease the contempt. And so there's a lot of people talking about that. Even Patel talks about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm part of the advisory council for the dignity index. They're talking about that. It's not that you have to not, you don't have to agree, but you have the right to say and to have your opinion and your experience. And I honor that, right? Mm -hmm. So help me understand that instead of it's us versus them or we are going to be destroyed if we don't destroy them first, right? Mm -hmm. That's at the bottom of the dignity index. And the top is, you know, I honor you and your contribution to this world. Um, I haven't gotten there with some politicians, to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. But with some of their supporters, I can because I understand, I love them, right? And because I love them, I want to stay open and curious and, and don't let contempt speak, sneak into my conversation. That's how it moves. You talked about you're in peace teaching right now. Peace building. Peace building. Yeah. How does that work? It's the same kind of thing. So conflict resolution, right? Where it the the idea, like how do you solve how do you solve a Middle East crisis? Right? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things. So if you remember, um, like the troubles in Ireland, you had Northern Ireland and you had Ireland and you had the Catholics and Protestants and bombs and you know mm -hmm. shooting people. And how, how did they get over that? They they brought the right kind of stakeholders together, and that has to include women. Um, peace building processes that don't include women don't last as long. Um, they're, it's more superficial. It's not actually, you can't force peace in any kind of lasting way, right? You can have a treaty, you can put down your guns for a little while, but if it's not actually something that uh, is a positive peace, it, it'll just fall back in. So, so how do people do that? They talk to each other. Um, how did Nelson Mandela do it in South Africa, right? With terrible things that happened on both sides. He and um, Desmond Tutu, who is a reverend down there, they got people in the same room and they talked about how do we move forward from here? 
when I wrote about Rwanda, one of the things I wrote was um, about reconciliation villages. So a million people were murdered in a, a hundred days in 1994. Terrible, terrible slaughter. And the ethnic divisions were imposed by a European country who came to colonize. They didn't exist before then. Well, anyway, you had the split and then you had all this murder. So how do you get people to live together after that? What the government did is say, look, your village has been completely destroyed. We're paying for all this. We'll build the homes. You, you, but you're going to live here with people who used to be Hutu and people who used to be Tutsi. No, we're not going to follow each other that anymore. You don't That's have true. to forgive them, but you can't hate them, right? You have to respect them. And what happened is as they got to know each other and talk to each other, now they consider themselves sisters, brothers and sisters together. They would let each other watch each other's kids, right? And and made a conscious decision that we are going to live together in peace and harmony and we're not gonna go back to the old ways, right? That's a microcosm, but that's how you do it is you have to just person mm -hmm. by person, you know, work on, I, I see you as a human and I'm gonna honor you. Um, one of the things with peace building that Chad Ford has done, he wrote a book called Dangerous Love, is you have to turn towards each other. And if you're feeling under attack, it's very common to want to turn away, right? But you have to turn towards and and really start to understand why, why would somebody do this, right? Lots of good examples world around the world, right, of people who've been able to do this and plenty of opportunity to practice because it's so and are we talking about exactly the same thing with figuring out media and peace building yeah in in many ways right so i i think if you're looking at a media diet and and where you can start to be discerning is what is this emotional response that they're trying to get from me is it one story is it the whole diet, right? I think if you look at some news organizations, it's the whole diet. But how do you cover disasters? Like people want to know about what's happening in Hurricane Helene. Do you cover the helpers? Do you cover the National Guard? Do you cover the bodies that they're finding? Do you cover the cadaver dogs, right? Different news outlets have to, chosen different ways to approach it. Do you cover this is... You know, why, in fact, this is a story I saw, why did a mountain, a mountainous area have so much destruction from a hurricane when they're not on the coast? That's a really good question, right? Anyway, so yeah, it's, it's part of that and staying curious. Why are they doing this? What are they trying to make me feel? You know, there are some people who try to make you feel emotions. When I write, if I'm going to write a story like Rwanda, if I'm going to write about my kids, I want you to feel an emotion, right? That's mm -hmm one of the reasons I'm doing it, right? Um, if I'm just straight up reporting, I don't necessarily try to make you feel an emotion, but then it's boring. <laughs> Holly, real quick, sorry. I just remember something I wanted to bring up. So an article came out of the Trib very recently. You might have seen it. Thou shall not vote for Trump. He's from that Latter-day Saints view that. Mm -hmm. that. Do you think... Um, um, so this is based on uh, scripture, the LDS scripture. In fact, one of these people is a neighbor and friend of ours, but I'm questioning whether this is an effective tactic to try to, sh I don't know, kind of shame people that don't. I, I, just, I, I worry that as much as I might agree with the thesis of it, that it's not actually helpful because it's, it's not being truly yeah. curious and it's kind of, it's a heavy weight to here's here's thou thou shalt not vote for trump these prominent latter-day saints view that as a command from God. here's what i think it here's what i think it does and i think it's i think it's the same thing that you get with jeff flake endorsing kamala harris with liz cheney endorsing and campaigning with kamala harris you get you get a broader sense that it's okay to be in the church camp and the Democrat camp, right? Or at least right. the not Trump camp. Right. The, the, it, that didn't happen really in 2016 and not really in 2020, mm -hmm. right? But now at least it it lets people know they're not alone, right? Mm -hmm. Shaming is not going to work. It's not going to change. And that's what worries me about that. Yeah. It feels like 
you know, it, they're they're saying that you're you're being a bad Latter Day Saint if if you vote for Trump. And, and and but at the same time, so the Desert News just they published two, so they were back to back. One said, "I'm voting for Trump because I'm LDS," and the other one was like, "I can never vote for Trump because I'm LDS," right? Yeah. And and they're at least trying to say there's both sides, right? Yes. So one was Trent Staggs, and he's like, "Because I'm LDS, this is the guy," yes. right? And it's not going to change my mind. Right. I'm just going to change your mind, though, Steve. I don't know. So, but I'm on the fence. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, right? Maybe until early November. <laughs> so you've so what so what it does is it starts to build a movement that it's yeah. okay, right? It's yeah. you're not alone. Well, I like the Jeff Blake things, mm -hmm. but I don't hear them saying quite the same. Right, and it's different. And language I language here the, where the this is this is scripture. You're, you're the Tribune has an angle. The Tribune, well, in fact. And, the the Tribune was founded deliberately yeah. to be a counter and it's to valuable. the Desert News. And it needs to be, that's why we need it. I mean, yeah. would you agree we need it? Yeah. I, I look Peggy Fletcher Stack at the Trib great. does some really great work on religion. We've right? heard her here before. Yeah. And there are things that the Trib can say that will you will never see in the Desert News yeah. that need to be said. Yes. So yes. you know. Yeah. I yeah. Just one of those things where I wonder if we are really genuinely trying to move the peace going along. This does not feel like, you know, it's and quite in that vein. So it's, it's it's kind of demonizing the opposition, and that right, and that's where you start to get into trouble, right? You can, I, I think, if you can, if you consciously can make your point without demonizing the other side, right? You can say, I don't agree with this policy. I have really serious concerns about X, Y, Z. You're not saying you're a bad person if you disagree with me, right? What you're saying is this policy, like the implications of this policy, I wonder if we've thought all the way through. Um, there's so many examples from my time at the legislature and observing the legislature, right? But old day kindergarten is now a thing in Utah, but it took a long time to get there. And when I was a legislator, there was somebody who was like, okay, Full day kindergarten, people don't like that idea. What if we did full day, but it was the morning session and the afternoon session and they just come pick up their kid at lunchtime and take them back. Well, that doesn't work when you're a working, working mom or especially when you start to get in the lower socioeconomic status, maybe you don't have a car, yeah. you don't control your work hours, right? But that was the, well, but it worked for me. My wife always took my kids to uh -huh. kindergarten, right? And that's the problem. Yeah. is will it always work for me yeah. so anyway but when you can say you know i have real concerns about this policy because here's what i see as an unintended yes. consequence or here's who's negatively impacted oh okay people are going to listen to you a lot more than that uh unless like that huh unless they're legislators no legislators will too there are some who are really like they've dug their heels in the sand but a lot of legislators if you will approach them and say you know he had love to have a conversation especially if you already have a relationship but I'd love to have a conversation. Help me understand. I was in all of those DEI meetings. Yeah. They had already made up their mind for sure. Right? Yeah. Did you? For sure. Listen? They didn't. <laughs> Were but you here? They, already, they had already made up their minds. And yeah, that, that's the problem. Right? Yeah. That's the problem. How many states have done that? Uh, a bunch. 26 at least. A bunch of the red states. Yeah. And there's more coming. Yeah. It's not. Well... We are out of yeah. time. Let's give Holly a that hand. Was, <laughs> that was really, it felt kind of rambly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody being here. Your story about walking 500 miles is probably more interesting than if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> There's some relationship to what we talked about tonight, but yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, so. thank you for coming. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a thing. And sometimes, look, I'll tell you, my mental health, it struggles sometimes just seeing all this stuff. It's just, it's like swimming in sewage. And I'm like, I I just can't keep doing it. <laughs> do, you, do you get a perspective that it's tipping to a point where we can't come back? Or um... I hope that that's not the case. I, I hope that's not the case. Yeah. But with the world influences kind of seeming to all tip at the same time or... I, I don't know that it will tip and not come back, but it might be really rocky before it comes back, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that resets the U.S. is war. 
And that's sad, but it's true. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Yep. So I don't know if that's inevitable, but um, I, look, I'm I'm probably by nature more pessimistic, <laughs> but some people are more optimistic. I, I think there's a, I think there's a long game, the long arc of history. Mm -hmm. I think we are we're a lot better off than we were 100 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. We have so many advances. People don't die of gangrene like they used to, right? right? I mean, right. stuff still happens, right? But we have antibiotics and they work and we have medicines that work and we have, you know, child children live past age five now at almost 100%, right? They're not dying. Like in Africa, you, you'll have 20% or or sometimes more, depending on the country, um, are dead before they're five. Right now in Sudan, you've got um, more than 50% of the kids under five are starving to death and they're, but there's nothing that can save them, right? And so here we are, we're blessed. We've got lots of great stuff to look forward to. I look forward to hope and joy um, and less of doomsday. And I think it's gonna take the people who care about changing the, the rhetoric uh, they re we all need to step up and speak up, right? It's the silence that emboldens people, I think, sometimes, right? It's the whole, well, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a machinist. And when they came for me, there was nobody left to speak up, yeah. right? And and you see that there's lots of organizations that are pro-immigrant, lots of organizations that are pro-refugee. It's the, it's the Mr. Rogers mom, look for the helpers. They are there. Right, they're out there on the front lines talking about refugees or not like that. You, you can see it in Ohio. It's a red they state. You have back. they pushed back. The mayor did. The governor pushed back. They're like, please don't come. This is not true. Here's the businesses. Right, mm -hmm. they're a valuable part of our community. That part is important. Mm -hmm. That's important. Um, are you familiar with Kobani yogurt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, they're, they're really yogurt. Yeah. Oh, I think, well, who is he? Actually, the, actually <laughs> the yogurt. So the owner is a refugee, former refugee. He's in Idaho. And he deliberately hires refugees you, to work in his company. And he's like, how do you turn a refugee into not a refugee? You give him a job and a place to live, right? And and so, right, it's stuff like that where you just go, oh, if I'm going to buy yogurt, I'm going to buy Kobani yogurt. Why? Because I love what they're doing, right? So... I mean, stuff like that. And it, mm -hmm. it's, it is everywhere. It's just harder to find it. So in my newsletter, I do look for stories like that. I'll look for nonprofit stories that are, you know, that are helping the homeless or they're helping kids or, you know, even I'd say like homelessness in Utah, huge issue, maybe not as much as California, but when I first became aware that teenagers were experiencing homelessness, especially because of their sexual orientation being kicked out of their families. And Utah had a law that homeless shelters could not shelter a minor. That was, hmm. it seemed like a big problem, but you know what? They fixed it. They fixed the problem. And now not only do they have places for teens to go that are safe um, and they can shelter, but high schools are saying, we're going to have washing machines. We're going to have clothes. Showers. We're going to have mm -hmm. showers. We're going to have cots. Like we're, we're going to have food pantries mm -hmm. because they're starting to realize some of these kids don't have a safe place. Some of these kids are couch surfing. Mm -hmm. They're homeless. They're sleeping in their car. Um, I live down in Utah County in an, uh, an affluent area, but we have a food pantry in our area and we still have one in five people is food insecure in our area. People that my kids went to school with were food insecure, did not know where their next meal was coming from, right? Mm -hmm. And when you start to see it, then you do something. And that's one thing I think that's super great, right? Is that there are people out there trying to make a difference mm -hmm. um, and they just keep going. Mm. So You've been one of those people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Alaska <laughs> instead of a 90 degrees in Salt Lake in October. Yeah.